Well, uh, our text for this evening is to be found in Acts chapter 1 again, and uh, I'm going to read just the text itself, verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So uh, we come to um, our third session on the subject of Pentecostalism. The term Pentecostal, of course, is derived from the events that took place uh, as we read <coughs> recorded in Acts chapter 2 and particularly verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Its doctrines, Pentecostals, that is, is essentially post-conversion experience of the Holy Spirit, which we have seen is evidenced by the speaking of in other tongues. Apart um, from all other biblical teaching, on the Holy Spirit. For instance, in Romans chapter 8, Galatians chapter 5, and chapters 14 through 16 of John's Gospel. Uh, without regard to any of these other uh, passages, it is distinctively centered uh, on this event in Acts chapter 2 alone. Donald G., one of the um, main uh, confessors, professors, uh, theologians, preachers um, of Pentecostalism, confesses that the centre of the message is Jesus, but he freely acknowledges that, well, other Christians can make exactly the same claim. If there was a conference, assembly, a meeting, uh, that confess that Jesus was central to the meeting. Well, there are many other Christians who could make that claim, but that would not make it a Pentecostal confession or assembly. To be Pentecostal, an addition is needed. What is that addition? It's this unique experience claimed of Holy Spirit baptism a post-conversion experience, that is, of spirit baptism. It's been said that, generally speaking, in other areas of theology, Pentecostals would be the same as other conservative evangelicals. In the early stages of Pentecostalism, that would be probably more or less true. However, it must be said concerning the neo-Pentecostals, the new ones, they've moved on, and they are a different brand altogether. If we wish to be schematic, and we could be, uh, because, um, well, there have been different groups, movements of people that have, um, you know, um, centred, if you like, on particular aspects of theology. We could say, for instance, Protestantism is Christ-centred, Lutherism is grace-centred, Calvinism is God-centred, Anglicanism is church-centred, Anabaptism is heart-centred, Methodism is holiness-centred. But of course, well, what we should have is a balanced um, view of uh, the entirety of theology of God's revelation uh, in his word. So we come first of all to the definition of spirit baptism. Remember that we've discovered with regards to terminology that um, to be baptized, to be filled, to be sealed, to receive, all of these terms referring to uh, reception of the Holy Spirit, well we've seen that they all mean exactly the same thing. They are not referring to different experiences as is claimed by Pentecostalism. Plus, well, the need to be understood that, well, what they mean is full or fully. If a person receives the Holy Spirit, they receive him in fullness. If a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit, 
he is baptized fully in the Holy Spirit. But the difference, of course, in uh, Pentecostal circus circles is that um, they have this conviction regards fullness. They would say, for instance, uh, have you received the Holy Spirit, to which you answer, and they would say, ah, but have you received the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Um, this, of course, referring to uh, their second blessing, post-conversion experience, uh, a further experience of the Holy Spirit, which brings a fullness that you may not have encountered. So, the fullness of the Spirit. A person does not receive, according to Pentecostalism, that is, a person does not receive fullness at conversion, but subsequently, afterwards, post-conversion. Holy Spirit baptisms, full reception, according to their theology. And the word baptism, of course, for them, is significant in their understanding. They use that word baptism, and they use it significantly, they use it deliberately. Spirit baptism. Because it carries the thought, the thinking, you see, of something traumatic, of traumatic signification of being overcome. As, well, you'll understand being Baptists, that uh, you, you're being immersed in, in water, uh, you, you're being overcome by something, by an element that's greater than yourself. And that's the thinking, you see, that's the, um, that's the thinking, just as one is, is, is immersed in water, so one, you need to be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Uh, by means of, uh, you know, a, a, a person's, a person is, is supernaturally, experientially, in full consciousness, immersed or submerged, if you like, by the power of the Holy Spirit. They prefer the designation baptized in or with the Holy Spirit, or they believe that every Christian is baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. That is conversion. Well, they fully, fully acknowledge that. But Christ is not baptized, has not baptized them into the Holy Spirit, which of course is the Pentecostal experience. One theologian says, in the new birth, the Holy Spirit's the agent, the atoning blood of Christ is the means, the new birth is the result. But in Holy Spirit baptism, according to Pentecostalism, that is, Christ is the agent, the Holy Spirit is the means, and the result of it is this endowment of power from on high. So all Christians baptized by or of the Holy Spirit, but not necessarily in or with the Holy Spirit. The understanding is that the promise uh, of the Father is given. Um, well, in, in the most striking definition, in the words of John the Baptist here in verse 4, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For truly John baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. They, of course, are assuming, they do, of course, assume um, uh, a baptism by immersion. It's dramatic, it's critical. That's the point, you see. It's, um, of course, it's, it's, it's nothing less than the fullness of the promise. Anything less than experiential, um, less experiential than baptism in water, fails to do justice to the promise um, of Holy Spirit baptism, the promise of the Father. So they hold that all believers are entitled to this baptism and should ardently and intensely expect and seek after it. They ought to earnestly seek the promise of Holy Spirit baptism. They hold this to be the normal experience of the early church 
And with it, along with it, comes an endowment of power for life and service. The bestowal of the gifts of the Holy Spirit for their uses in the work of ministry. This experience is distinct. It is subsequent to new birth, that is, to conversion. And it is evidenced, how? By the initial physical sign of speaking in other tongues as at Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. So the main characteristics are, one, a distinct uh, post-conversion experience, two, evidence by tongues, three, it must be earnestly, even intensely taught and sought after. Well, we'll deal with with the with with uh, the first of these firstly the doctrine of subsequent spirit baptism most admit that the doctrines tied completely to acts the acts of the apostles there alone they say they claim that we have the impressive historical demonstration of holy spirit baptism they pay no heed to any other part of scripture of any other part of, of the revelation of God concerning this. It's all centred in, here you have the historical record, this is how it's done, this is how it's happened, and this is how it outworks in the lives of these people in this history in the Acts of the Apostles, indicating the important Holy Spirit experience that is subsequent to conversion. It all rests upon their exegesis, their interpretation of the Holy Spirit and his working, his actions in the Acts of the Apostles. But do remember that, well, we've seen some of them, the, the second blessing harbingers, that is, the forerunners. Remember that there were forerunners to this, the Wesley brothers, George Whitfield, U.S. revivalism, the, holy, the holiness movements such as Keswick teaching for many years, men such as Andrew Murray, F.B. Mayer, A.B. Simpson, A.G. Gordon, R.A. Torrey, the latter of which, of course, was the principal of Moody Bible College in Chicago in USA. He was the one who gave theological credence to this second blessing theology. And then, of course, more lately, we have, uh, uh, well, such as Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who also taught second blessing theology, along with many of his Welsh counterparts. So um, these are the people you see, the forerunners. These are the people you might say, by and large, who laid down the seedbed of Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism feels, experience is, that's the, 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 the main thing. It feels, you know. And it's built as doctrine on scripture, mainly as I say, the Acts of the Apostles, and of course tradition. Because you see, they will quote the forerunners. They will tell you about Wesley. They'll tell you about revivalism. They'll tell you about the holy, holiness movement. They'll tell you about the, the forerunners. And, uh, and of course, well, they, they'll, they'll go back even further than that. They'll go back to the apostles. They'll point to the acts of the apostles and they'll say, look, this is how it was with the apostles. This is how it was with us. And this is how it should be with you. And, uh, well, as I say, upon recent evangelical church history, it will claim a, a, a third source, experiential, its primary justification is this experience. We have had this experience. Who can deny it? Well, how do you deny somebody's experience? You tell me. Somebody says to, the, says to them that God spoke to them in such and such a way, or God's done this, or God's done that. Well, how can you disprove it? So uh, its uh, subsequence, um, uh, the, the, the feature 
uh, of Pentecostalism, they argue, see, that this is our inheritance. And they will insist upon reputable sources for their argument. The apostles, modern evangelicals, the harbingers, the forerunners, who laid the Pentecostal seedbed, which they have just followed on from. So, their second blessing, exegesis interpretation. They believe that their Pentecostalism and their experience of Holy Spirit baptism, as per Acts chapter 2, that will stand the test of Scripture. In Acts chapter 2 verse 4, they claim that those who were waiting must have been Christians prior to this. Now, this is an important point. And I ask you to call to mind to remember our studies in uh, Luke's Gospel. And I tried at various stages. I tried to show to you, to prove to you, that the apostles, that the disciples of the Lord Jesus, that they were not Christians, they had not been converted, they had not been saved, they had not encountered the new birth. They were not, they did not become Christians until the day of Pentecost. And I labored that point uh, because I knew that we were coming to this eventually. Now, uh, I may have made hard work of it, but I think, um, I think that um, I, I brought it to a clear conclusion when we came to uh, Luke chapter 24, the last chapter of the Gospel, where it became apparent, apparent that these men were not converted. They were unbelieving. They didn't believe the scriptures and the Lord Jesus upbraided them for it. And then he opened their minds. He opened their understanding to understand the scriptures. Everything that the scriptures had taught about him, his suffering, his death and his resurrection. And then the light shines. Then the illumination comes. Then the experience of the Holy Spirit comes. And of course, I also, I also um, showed you how that there was an overlap at the end of the Gospel 24 and into the Acts of the Apostles. There is an overlap in the teaching. So, um, the Pentecostal claim is, you see, that um, that these early disciples, that the apostles that these 120 in the upper room who are waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, they must have been Christians prior to that. They cannot prove that. They claim, they say, that the apostles had first, had a first, had a partial initiation prior to this. And they would quote John 20 verse 22. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. The Lord Jesus says to them. Well, John 20, you see, is the end of the gospel. Like as in Luke 24. It's that overlap. Peter himself, as I have showed you previously, himself says, in dealing with Cornelius and his household, says that they have received the Holy Spirit the same as we did when we were converted Pointing back, of course, to their own experience at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So, must have been Christians prior to this is a no-no. The result is that they believe that, um, you see, they have a clue to the church's weakness. They see the church's weakness, they see its powerlessness... Uh, they see the infiltration of the world into the church. And, uh, well, they have, they, they have the answer to it, you see. And it's this, it's this. The church hasn't been taught to wait, to tarry in the way that these, the apostles, um, these early disciples um, were taught. And so what the church needs to do, it needs to have waiting meetings. Where you wait for the Holy Spirit, you pray intensely, and you, oh, you do all kinds of things. We'll come to them in a minute. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait. You wait for something to happen. You wait for the Holy Spirit to come, as the Lord taught his apostles. Well, I went to great pains to explain to you, when we dealt with Acts chapter 1, 
what that waiting was about. They were doing nothing. They were just hanging out. That's all. They were just simply waiting. They weren't taught, they weren't told to have waiting meetings, tarrying meetings, as the Pentecostals would call them. You see? But it's because we don't have these waiting meetings, because we don't have, we don't have this Holy Spirit baptism, this subsequent, this, uh, this, this post-conversion experience of Holy, Holy Spirit ba- baptism. Therefore, we are in weakness, we're powerless. Therefore, we don't have this endowment that they have this power for service. And then in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, there they teach three baptisms. Where the Apostle Peter, he tells his, uh, his converts that, um, you know, what the people he's preaching to, uh, prior to their conversion, what they need to do is that they need to uh, repent, uh, be baptized in water, and they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now they say there are three baptisms there. There's conversion, number one, two, water baptism, and three, Holy Spirit baptism. See? Now they believe that most Christians, their fault is, their problem is, your problem is, that um, you stopped at two-thirds. You've been converted, number one. You've been baptized in water, number two. Ah, but you haven't gone on to the fullness, to number three. So you're left powerless. But if you want the fullness experienced in the Acts of the Apostles, you must wait on the Lord and you must press on to the third. They find the same halfway Christians in Samaria in Acts chapter 8 and verses 4 through 25. They've been converted, they've been forgiven. Uh, but they have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, verses 14 through 17. These are passages and these are matters that we will come back to in due course. I'm just at the moment telling you what Pentecostals would say, what they believe and what they teach. Water baptism, they would acknowledge is important, or they wouldn't miss that out, but it's insufficient, it's not enough. One of their major evidences is um, you, you, uh, Paul in, in Acts chapter 9 uh, verses 1 through 19 where he was converted on the Damascus road and they say of course yes he was converted on the Damascus road but it was three days later when he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Paul um, would not be satisfied with being just a Christian. That wouldn't be enough. He would have to be a spirit-filled one. And then in Acts chapter 19, verse, verses 1 through 7, at Ephesus, there are disciples found with faith, but they haven't got the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, they haven't even heard that there is such a thing as the Holy Spirit. This is their crowning argument. You see? There they are. They're Christians. They've got faith. And they haven't got the Holy Spirit. And then there's, in the Gospels, there's the Lord's experience of Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, He was filled, if you remember, with the Holy Spirit uh, from his mother's womb, from birth. And then, of course, he's baptized in the Jordan River by uh, by John the Baptist. And then, of course, immediately uh, following that, the Holy Spirit in dove-like form descends upon him Pentecostals say, there you are, he's baptized in the Holy Ghost. So the sum of the matter is that the fullness of experience, the full experience of the Holy Spirit is subsequent to conversion, separate from, distinguishable. um, You are very, very conscious of it. Then, Uh, lastly we come to the second blessing benefits what are the benefits of this Holy Spirit baptism well firstly there's permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit we wouldn't argue with with that the Holy Spirit comes and he comes to dwell uh, in us and, and that forever 
Uh, and yet they say this, <laughs> they say this in spite of a prev prevalency of Arminian theology which teaches you can be lost and you can be saved one day and be lost the next. How do you square that? I don't know. But two, secondly, there's personal indwelling. Thirdly, fullness of indwelling. Fourthly, power for service. And then fifthly, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. By that, of course, they mean stuff like um, prophecy and speaking in other tongues and other things. But um, we'll come to that eventually. So many insist that Holy Spirit baptism, they would acknowledge, they would say, uh, well, it's not essential to salvation. You know, no, no, no. They would, they would never say to you that, you know, that were well, you not saved, you know. They wouldn't go that far. Maybe some would, but uh, I've never met any that would. But in spite of this, in spite of this, they frequently assert it's a distinct link in the chain. It links us to Christ, so without it, you've got a missing link in your relationship to Christ. You're still somewhere outside. This, beloved, is heresy. This is the Colossian heresy. This is, well, you need this something else. These are things you see that Paul's dealing with in his letters constantly. The Judaizers come amongst the Christians and they say, you know, the Galatians, well, you need to be circumcised. Yes, you've got Christ, that's good, that's fine, that's lovely, but you haven't been circumcised. You need circumcision as well to be a full-blown Christian. Heresy, says Paul. Damnable heresy. Away with it. Ye are complete in him, in Christ. You've got everything. All the blessings of God are ours in Christ. So regards the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit affords them, Pentecostals that is, uh, affords them gifts uh, for ministering the charismata, hence the term charismatic. Charis is the word grace, grace gifts. Paul deals with them in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13 and 14. The charismata. These spiritual gifts, tongues, prophecy, faith, miracles, healings and such like are the most prized amongst Pentecostals and they quite naturally fit, fit into the shape of the Pentecostal gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, we come lastly this evening to the conditions and there are conditions for Holy Spirit baptism. Many, there are many takes on this. This isn't the only one, believe me. Uh, you know, there are uh, uh, threads that run off from this, other uh, corridors that, that, that others run down. Uh, they, they come, Pentecostals come in many different shapes and sizes. You'll find that the older variety are the more sound. In the early days of Pentecostalism, um, it was, it was uh, uh, apart from the experience thing, it was, it was fairly uh, biblical. The theology was, was fairly sound. But it took a turn, I think, maybe somewhere in the, in the 20th century, uh, 1960s and onwards, and then, of course, the arrival of the neo-Pentecostals. And, of course, it's just, well, uh, my understanding is that they've, they've just left the Bible behind. But you'll, get, you'll generally find that the older, the older Pentecostals, if you can find one, uh, find them, you'll find that they are more sound in their theology. So, as I say, there are many takes on this. Um, we could, if we wished, we could narrow it, narrow it down to three pre- and subsequent conditions, one conversion, two obedience, and three faith. But there are wide variety is a wide variety of steps leading to Holy Spirit baptism and its benefits. Conversion is number one. 
it's impossible for an unconverted person to receive the Holy Spirit. Now what may surprise us is not just, uh, this is not just said, uh, but that, that you could that anyone, any, well, any Christian anyway, that, that they, they could um, conceive, that they could possibly think uh, of the possibility of a person being converted and not having the Holy Spirit. You can't be converted. It's the Holy Spirit who works conversion in us. He comes and he breathes life, the life of God into our souls, and he brings us to the place and the point of conversion. You see, we have to understand as well the order of salvation. We don't believe in order to be chosen. We are chosen in order to believe. Now it begins eternity past. The choosing, the election of God. Chosen by God in eternity and in time God comes to us in his time, his good pleasure. Person might be a child in a crib, person might be a teenager, they might be in their 80s, their 90s, they might be at death door. He comes as and when he sovereignly pleases and chooses, he breathes life by his spirit into the soul. Nothing takes place prior to that, nothing. So life from the dead. We expect a corpse to react, to, to respond, to do anything. So life comes first. And it's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of life, is breathed into the soul, made alive. And then God comes and he gives the gifts of repentance and faith, brings us to conversion. So the, to even, even consider the possibility That a person could be converted and not have the Holy Spirit is utter nonsense. But this is the first Pentecostal imperative conversion, then Holy Spirit baptism. Obedience is the second one. Active obedience, that is, both negative and positive. Separation from sin. All sin must be removed in order to receive the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm pretty glad that that's not true because if that was the case, then I would never have received the Holy Spirit. And neither would you. Because none of us are completely, utterly separated from sin. Anything large or small must go. Are Torre, the man who I've already uh, mentioned, the principal of Moody Bible College uh, some years back now, who gave credibility, theological credibility to this doctrine, uh, he illustrates his point on one occasion, uh, talking about this woman who was seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it was never coming to her. She prayed and prayed and prayed, but it never came. And there was a small matter that God wanted to deal with. It was something to do with pins in her hair. And uh, she wasn't dealing with it and wasn't dealing with it. And one night, in the middle of the night, in prayer on her knees before the Lord, she decided they've got to go. She pulled the pins out of her hair, skated them across the floor, her hair fell down and the Holy Spirit came to at the same time. She was baptized in the Holy Spirit. The disobedience was gotten rid of. See? And then, of course, there's the inner, inner obedience, humility of heart, submission to God in the heart. So obedience is number two. Thirdly, heart purity. By faith, they quote Acts chapter 15, verse 8 and 9, uh, where uh, Paul, speaking to the Ephesians, uh, uh, speaks about uh, our hearts being purified by faith. This, of course, is laid hold upon and taken. Um, this is the, holy, the holiness movement revisited. Instant, entire sanctification. The indwelling of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit baptism, requires a heart that's free of sin. He will not dwell with that which is unholy. Now, we are all for holiness. We are all for sanctification. We are all for the mortification of sin. We are all for dealing with sin as much as be in us. Our goal 
the place we are heading for is perfection. As much as we are able to, we strive along with any Christian against sin as much as is in us to do so. But the truth of the matter is that in this life, in this world, no man shall ever be free, utterly free of sin. Utterly holy. So how much, I ask my Pentecostal friend, how pure does my heart have to be? How much sin do I have to get rid of? before God will baptize me in the Holy Spirit. And then prayer is the, uh, the fourth one, and this is the most frequent condition, seeking with an intensive, and I mean intensive, very intensive, persevering prayer. The gift of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, is not received without prayer. Now I freely acknowledge we are to pray for the Holy Spirit. We are to ask God for his Holy Spirit. More of his influence, more of his power. On the preaching of his word and for conversions and, and for enablement, wisdom in our own service, our own warfare, our own battle against sin. Yes, we, we, we freely acknowledge we need the Holy Spirit and we are to ask and we are to pray for the Holy Spirit. But this is something else. This is with an intensity, a persevering prayer, which, of course, in there, again in itself, isn't necessarily wrong. But not just prayer, a certain kind of prayer. If the Holy Spirit baptism doesn't follow, then they will say to you, there's something defective with your praying. You're not praying enough. You're not praying hard enough. You're not praying long enough. Um, or maybe your faith defect, you're not believing enough. Well, how much do you have to believe? So there's a person with a weak faith because we're not all given the same measure of faith. Some One person has a stronger faith than another. So does the person with weak faith, uh, is he or she left out of it? Often you'll find that in their meetings, um, when they've been praying for people, uh, one of their leaders has been praying for uh, the healing of a person and uh, uh, he'll put his hands on them and pray for them to be healed. Nothing happens and they'll tell him so and he'll say, oh, you, you, you're unbelieving, you haven't, got, you haven't got the faith. Couldn't be them, <laughs> couldn't be them, couldn't be something wrong with them. It's you, you haven't got enough faith or any faith at all. But this intense of this persevering prayers, part of the act of obedience, brought to a head. Accompanied with a passive obedience, one submissive to the Holy Spirit's promptings. When he prompts you, you go to prayer, submit yourself to God. Then secondly, <coughs> yielding yourself, yielding yourself, this is the fifth one, yielding or emptying, it's called. Perfect yielding of your body, soul, and spirit. Now that's a trichotomy. There's three things there. Body, soul, spirit. Right? Trichotomy. But the Bible teaches that man is a dichotomy. He has but a body and soul. Two. Yeah? But it's only when there is a perfect yielding, a complete yielding to God of body, soul and spirit. Even one's tongue has to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Oh, you haven't got the gift because your tongue's not surrendered to the Holy Spirit. When you are sufficiently emptied of yourself, and I don't know how you do that, then the Holy Spirit will come. And all this is in the context of tarrying or waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. Now it's all very interesting. It's a, an error, it's an error in theology. Um, 
And of course, um, uh, it's only one, because there are many others. It's only one. But we're dealing with it because it's a very prevalent one today, and many, many people go chasing after it, and many people are very sadly deluded by it. Uh, there are extremities, uh, but we have to acknowledge and we have to be sensible and we have to be loving and kind. Um, we have to seek to, um, to bring people out of this as much as we possibly can and help them to understand the errors of it. And of course, um, uh, we haven't got to be proud, uh, arrogant or hard um, because there's, well, there's a danger in our own circles of that very thing, and that will not do. And I would remind you too that amongst Pentecostals there are some very serious and some very sincere godly people who would put some of us in reform circles to shame with regards to their holiness, their godliness, their walk with the Lord, their zeal for the Lord and for his mission. So keep this, beloved, please keep this in balance. Yeah? It's very, very important. Paul says um, in, in uh, dealing with, with these very matters, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, um, he says, I, he says you, you can speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but if you haven't got love, if you haven't got love, he says, you're just a, a gonging piece of brass, a tinkling symbol, that's all you are. He says, you can have the gift of prophecy, and you can understand all mysteries, all knowledge, you can be absolutely sound, rock solid sound in doctrine. But if you haven't got love, you are nothing, he says. You can even give all your goods to the poor. You can even give your body to the fire to be burned. You can even become a martyr. But if you don't do it in love, it doesn't mean anything at all. You are nothing. But, having said all that, we ask ourselves concerning these conditions that we have looked at. All five of them. Yielding, emptying yourself, um, prayer, uh, obedience. All of these that I've noted here this evening. And the question I want to leave you with is this. Is it a gift or is this graft? One can only be left puzzled, amazed when they declare that the gift, a gift, yeah, a gift is something, is it not, that's given, just purely, simply given, promised, the promised Holy Spirit is, they would say, by faith alone. Yet immediately joined to the statement, he will freely give the Holy Spirit as we meet his conditions. So if it's conditional, it's not a gift. If you have to ask for it, it's not a gift. If you have to be obedient for it, it's not a gift. If you have to pray for it, strive for it, the freedom of the gift is always maintained, yet always predicated on the meeting of prior conditions. And as you examine the experiences of those who have received, you find that they have never received their baptism of the Spirit without hard work on their part. It is graft, not grace. One of their soberest writers, Donald G., says, We ought not to fight and wrestle and work to receive the Holy Spirit. That's good. That's wonderful. Good news. Yet in refu reviewing some Pentecostal baptisms on another occasion, the same author says, this was in Africa, he says, 
Oh, how they cried, groaned, and groveled in the dust as they wrestled their way to victory. So you have to grovel, you have to groan, you have to cry in order to get the gift. So, the Pentecostal, Pentecostal experience, we see that there is uh, more than faith involved. So to summarize, to conclude, when asked, um, when asked um, if, um, if we've appropriated these or the other benefits um, outside of in addition to simple faith which apprehends Christ or the simple grace by which Christ apprehends us that sounds much better to me uh, through obedience however exemplary of faith however entire then the Protestant is compelled not just to analyse Pentecostalism but to criticise it as well and as we do we remember it is criticism not just of the Pentecostals today but their forerunners some of our darlings and we have their hymns many of them we have their hymns in our book Wesley's they were the forerunners they were the ones who sowed the seed of this stuff we do well to remember that if you had the Wesley Brothers hymns as they were first written in this book you would throw it in the dustbin they're not fit to sing the theology is rubbish Wesley, the Wesley Brothers hymns that we sing have been altered have been doctored the theology has been corrected hmm? so remember Pentecostalism has inherited all this stuff from these forerunners. They have just simply carried to full consequence the legacy of Wesley Whitfield and many others, perhaps even some of the Puritans. Next week we'll turn to um, uh, what they refer to as the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is another outworking of um, their experience. Amen.